Good morning or afternoon, everyone. Hey, this is Jeff Johnson, your host of the Local Leaders Podcast, here with another super exciting uh, restaurant tour uh, by the name of Paul Peterson of Wake Oasis Coffee. Welcome to the podcast, Paul. I thank you very much. I appreciate you hosting me. Hey, man, we are uh, just really uh, thrilled and excited to have you have you take time out of your day to talk to us and kind of share your your story and your experience and all the stuff you had to go through over over the years to kind of get where you are. Uh, there's so many other owners out there and operators who uh, have kind of gone through similar stories and or similar uh, experiences and uh, uh, everything that we can take and learn from each other, I think helps. So looking forward to it. And, you know, with that, let me just hand it off to you, uh, Paul, to kind of share the story about Wake Oasis and uh, kind of get us all up to speed on what you guys are all about. No problem. I appreciate it. Well, my name is Paul Peterson. I'm the uh, CEO and founder of Wake Oasis Coffee. We have two locations located in Apex, North Carolina. We actually just launched franchising uh, a couple months ago when we we're in the process of growing throughout North and South Carolina and, uh, and Virginia. So we're really excited. We have uh, two concept models that we've um, launched to market. One is a more traditional brick and mortar model that has your drive through, your dine in, and mobile app service. The other is a more non traditional, but we think it's a very innovative concept that utilizes storage shipping containers. Uh, we call it a coffee shop in a box, and it allows people to get open faster. So the runway to revenue is shorter. Uh, it's a uh, aesthetically pleasing design. It focuses on a drive through uh, and mobile apps service for customers. So you meet customers where they're at and take advantage of the, um, not just the existing trends, but the trend lines taking you out into the future. And it's a really cool design. That's a little bit less expensive than a brick and mortar uh, building concept. So really excited by that. And we think it's something innovative that allows us to um, be more nimble and flexible as we come to market. So that's a little bit about us and kind of where we're at right now. Well, thank you for sharing that, Paul. And for all of those who uh, are just, you know, tuning in and kind of listening to Paul talk about his uh, his coffee shop in a box, you got to check out the website, which we'll have flashing up here on the, on the screen for you. Go take a look at, you know, what that concept looks like. Cause it's, it's I, I believe the pictures are still there, right, Paul? Well, yeah, they're still there and it's really exciting. We, um, you know, one of the first problems that I think a lot of business owners run into is how do you get customers to see you? And yeah. um, with our design, they will see you. Uh, it's, it's an innovative design. The way we've oriented the boxes, we think, is not only provides strong utility value, but again, it's, it's a nice aesthetic value. As we were looking at this shop through the, the architectural and the engineering process, what I kept telling the architect is, I want this to be a place that I want to go right now and drink coffee. And I think we hit a home run with it. It's a place that every time I see it, it's like, man, I want to go there right now and sit down. And, and there's outdoor seating. There's a veranda top seating as well, in addition to drive through So it's a place that I think is fun. It gets people's attention. And it also can serve, um, serve a lot of customers in a short period of time. So it's got um, strong throughput potential. And I really think it helps people take advantage of um, you know, site considerations. And, and again, meeting customers where they're at, which is a quick serve premium product. Yeah, that that is really uh, it's really an amazing opportunity. And and how'd you come up with this with this concept? Did it just poof one day you had it, or have you seen seen something that kind of got you going? Where'd it come from? I've been interested in so my background is actually if I go way back, I got my master's degree in urban planning. So I've always been interested in in unique design, unique aesthetic, how you can use maybe non-traditional construction and design methods on parcels of land. And so, um, you know, I had seen other kind of container concepts, but they were always closer to a food truck than an actual building or a built constructed um, uh, unit. And so the idea was like, okay, well, how do I see us, what, what trends have been accelerating out of the pandemic? So 2020 was a rough year for a lot of people. We we're really fortunate that out of our locations, we only had a very modest, uh, very small drop in revenue in one location and actually saw growth year over year in the other location. And part of that is because we had delicious products, great service, but also we have a really strong throughput with our drive through And so how can we take advantage of those things and allow other people to take advantage of that as well in opening their own businesses? Um, and so we really just sat down and we thought about it. We came through a lot of different iterations as far as the container concept, the size, the, the, the orientation, how we put them together. Um, and we really started from the premise of what problems 
can we solve for business owners as they seek to enter the market? So mm -hmm. all business owners run into challenges when they start trying to open up their own business. And so we thought, okay, well, what can we do to make that easier? And so the coffee shop in a box model comes obviously built, spec for equipment, workflows, recipes. It's essentially everything that a new business owner would need to be able to go forth and start generating revenue. It gets you about 90% there. Obviously, you have to do some site work and there's going to be um, promotion stuff, but then we have those packages ready as well for people. And so, um, you know, anybody who's ever opened a, a, a restaurant or business uh, from, from scratch knows how hard it is to try to find an architect, find a contractor, yeah. find a broker, source your equipment, develop your workflows, particularly if you, this is your first time doing it. And so we just remove all of those hurdles and thought, how do we make this as easy as possible for people to get in there? And we, through the training process, work to focus on building the best coffee shop owners that we can versus having them focus on all of the other pre-work that that has to be done before they even get to open and kind of flip around the sign on their shop and, and hang their open shingles. So that's what we're really focusing on. And so to me, that's what's a little bit different about what we have and what we're bringing to market. And we're able to help people take advantage of that. That is that is really really cool, and I love the way you talk you talk about it and kind of kind of walk us you know down the path. It makes it seem super easy to kind of get in. I know there's always risk when you when you're starting a business. But you, you've taken a lot of risk out of it, you know, through this through this um, model because you've already proven it. Well, and I think that's that, that's true. And I think one of the other aspects that people don't talk about is and and you know this if you've gone through the the design and construction process of a new space, um, whether you've built out first generation space, second generation space, et cetera, or even done a, a, a new built construction, you're gonna have change orders, you're gonna have um, site conditions might change. So you might start, um, you know, be two thirds of the way through construction and the architectural drawings that you have might be different than what the actual site conditions are. So now you're in, you, you know, you have to spend more money for, change orders or maybe um, unnecessary build out that you didn't think you had. And so that can take a, you know, $150,000 project to make it a $200,000 project or a $250,000 project to make it a $300,000 project. Yeah. And so what we do is we take a lot of that guesswork out of it. The shipping containers that we utilize are obviously engineered down to the nth degree because they're meant to stack, you know, dozens tall as they take a freighter over from, you know, China, Indonesia and other places. And so the engineering tolerances on those are so tight, they're really predictable as far as build out and construction. And so we don't have, you know, that efficiency in, in design and construction has been built into the construction documents and the architectural and engineering process. Uh, the contractor that we have on board understands what we're trying to do and has built his team around those levels of efficiency of, of construction as well. Um, because there's predictability, you know, the same air, you know, um, HVAC units that we're putting in one, we're putting in all of them, the conduit for electrical and plumbing, um, you know, the, the floor, the flooring, the FRP for the walls, all of that stuff can be planned out because they know that we're going to be doing not just one, but two, three, four, five, so that you can use those products over and over again, instead of just a one-off run. So yeah, it's, it's really cool. And so it's, it's really, um, trying to fold some of those, that predictability into pricing. And again, make it easier for people to get open and start generating revenue, which is really what it's all about. Yes, sir. Absolutely. And, and from a, from an investment point of view, without giving away uh, too much, I'm just curious as to, um, you know, this non-traditional methodology or, or option that you have is, is it significantly less costly than going a traditional route? Or can you give me an idea of kind of the percentage? The site conditions are going to be close. I mean, once you, you have to pay for your, your site engineering, um, it's probably going to be about 25% cheaper, but it's also going to be about 40% faster yeah. is what we estimate. Um, and it's because what we're able to do is we've developed a concurrent construction model instead of a consecutive construction model. And so what we're able to do is instead of doing your traditional construction where you have your, your daisy chaining together, and so you're going to have your you know, your site work, and then you're going to have your foundation, then you're going to have your walls, and then you're going to have mm -hmm. all these things. So you have this very linear process. What we're doing is we're going to be taking that construction process and we're going to be doing the site work here, and then we're building the building offsite here. So you're actually collapsing it down and having it be more efficient. And then what it does is it meets here in the middle when we put it together. Mm -hmm. So each phase takes about six to eight weeks, and then we have about two weeks for marrying it up versus 
a longer process where you could be looking at 12, 16, 20 weeks for overall construction. And so that's really what we're looking at is, is not just time, um, which is obviously when you're looking at, at, at a commercial build out is money, um, because the faster you can get up and start generating revenue, that's going to be, that's going to get you into the black faster. That's going to start giving you some ROI on your investment. You're also looking at the hard cost because you have more predictability. You know exactly what this is going to cost because they're, they're buying this from us. So we have the preset cost of what it's going to be. And we're not going to be factoring in change orders and other things versus, again, you start getting into a, a stick built construction. And most of these stick builts, you know, it's, it's a custom project. And we're not building a custom project. We're essentially applying building code standards, but utilizing a manufacturing methodology to build these, if that makes sense. Yeah. It's fortunate that the idea has resonated with a lot of people. And so, again, we're, we're working with a lot of people throughout the Carolinas and Virginia right now. Yeah. And hopefully we'll be announcing some uh, some future locations here shortly. Yeah, that, that, that sounds awesome. And, and kind of when usually I don't get into, you know, franchise type questions specifically. I'm just sure. curious, though, for myself, what, you know, when you when you acquire, uh, are you selling territories or you, you know, what's the distance, I guess, or the, the geographical footprint that that you're acquiring when you. Well, uh, and, that, yeah. and that's really depends on the area. It's going to be based on. Um, the density of the area it could be based on traffic flow. It could be based on whether you wanted to do one individual store, or whether you wanted to do a, a geographic area. And so, you know, if somebody wanted to do, you know, Greensboro, North Carolina, if they wanted to do Wilmington, North Carolina, or look at Greenville, South Carolina, you start looking at these different areas. Yeah. Um, you know, if we we're going to do an individual location, then what we would do is sit down and find that location within, you know, the 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 area that's been delineated. And then say, okay, well, what's a reasonable kind of non-compete um, distance that we could work with here? And again, if you're looking at a very um, high traffic count corridor where as the crow flies, you know, maybe two miles is a strong radius, but it might take you 15 minutes to drive two miles. Okay, well, that might be, two miles might be a, re a reasonable radius. Yeah. You know, if you're in a town of about 10,000 people, uh, two miles might push you out you know, you, you know, it, it might, you might be able to drive that pretty quickly. So it really just depends, but that's where we try to factor into is more about drive time than just distance. Yeah. That, that is, I appreciate you explaining that because, you know, that does make sense. It, it's, a, there's not a straight yes or no kind of answer. It, it all depends on the, the, the traffic, the distance, the, you know, all the different parameters of the market that you're that you're looking at so it does and we have a really strong broker that we bought on brought on board one of the things that we focused on is really you know how do we build out the best team possible and so we have a um from a um, an sba lending team to the broker to the architect to the contractor to you know the marketing and pr team you know the team that we have on board you know their whole focus is to help franchisees and these new business owners be successful in, in what they're doing and really provide the best stewardship possible for their, their investment. And so, you know, we go back to, you know, how do we maintain the brand, drink quality, drink recipes, and help them implement that portion of it. And then again, we have the broker to help find them the best location possible within a given delineate, delineated area. We have the marketing professionals to help them implement the vision and to be able to give them tactics and tools and, and education to be able to help, whether it's social media, whether it's print marketing, you know, uh, different locales, different types of guerrilla marketing and different types of tools are going to work and have um, be effective in different ways. And so it's really talking through some of those specifics. But yeah, we think we've got a great team on board to try to help people be successful. So that's really what we're focusing on. That is that is really, really cool. And again, for all of our listeners, um, you know, go check it out on the website, uh, which again, we'll have up on the screen. And Make sure that uh, you take a look at it. It's, it. it's really an exciting opportunity. Have you got your franchise uh, uh, info up on the site now? We do, yep. People can take okay. a look at that. It's www.wakeoasiscoffee.com. And they can take a look on our franchise page. We have uh, information about the um, coffee shop in a box model. We have some information about just who we are. You know, we are a fun, beach-inspired uh, coffee shop. We believe in delivering great, great hospitality, great, uh, delicious drinks. We focus on specialty premium coffee that are uh, bespoke and custom made for you. When you order, uh, nothing comes from concentrate. Uh, nothing comes in a box. Everything is made, uh, made to order and is made fresh in the shop from our cold brew to our teas. Um, 
And uh, we believe in delivering that in a quick serve environment. So we've come up with very specific workflows and processes to be able to customize drinks for people and have it be done in a quick serve environment that allows them to get something delicious, but then not have to get their kids out of the car seats and shuffle them out through the elements and the weather. They can just pull through the drive through and then move on about their day and yeah. then do it with a smile. That's, that is the way the things are today. Everybody wants to be able to order online or, um, or have a, a quick serve uh, opportunity. Yeah. Um, well, you know, and one of the cool things about what we've, what we've done is we don't, we don't view our drive throughs as purely transactional. And I think that's where a lot of other places fall short. The drive through for a lot of these other places, a place where you, you, you pull up to a nondescript window, you know, somebody, you know, you give somebody money, they give you food and then you drive off. That is the extent of the relationship. And so what we have is, you know, we want to bring our flavor, the inside personality that we have to the outside. So whether we still want to get to know our customers, we still want to talk to you, you still got to get a smile. We, through our design, through our, you know, we have different types of interactive experiences, whether it's a wall mural, whether it's, we have a shelf that people can take and leave different tchotchkes, you know, all these little things that we try to do to bring some of our personality to the drive through So when people come through, it's not just a transactional experience. It is a, it is a coffee shop. It is the feel of a coffee shop, but it's through a quick serve drive through environment. Yeah. And so that's what we focus on. So you're still going to be getting, you know, top service, top hospitality. You're still going to greet people who know who you are and care about you and your drinks, but it's just going to be meeting them where they're at, which just happens to be in their car that day. Mm -hmm. Amazing. I love it. I love it. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a great concept and, um, you guys have, have now, let me backtrack just a second. When did you sure. start your, um, Wake Oasis at, um, for your first location? Uh, it's 2008. Okay. So, yeah. And the second location opened, uh, fall of 2019, September of 2019. So right before the pandemic. Great timing, right? <laughs> you know, we, we, you don't choose these things. It's, I, I've yeah. joked with other people before that it's, um, you know, it's kind of like having a baby, right? You just do it and you just have faith that it's going to work out and you put your head down and make it happen. And there's never a perfect time to have a kid. There's never a perfect time to start a new job. There's never a perfect time to open a business. The, the, the perfect time is the time that you decide that you want to do it. And you decide that you're willing to put the effort into doing it. And so, you know, we went in, you know, we did it, we went all into it. Um, you know, again, we're fortunate that the, the, the recipes, the processes, the procedures for our drink making, for our, our employees, for our training, uh, the hospitality, the delicious drinks, all that stuff factored into, you know, year over year growth. Um, from 2019 to 2020 and then from 2020 into 2021. So, you know, you just, you just really try to put your head down and focus on, on, on the right things and taking care of customers and, and keeping your drink quality high. And, um, you know, we've been fortunate that it worked out well for us. Yeah. It's um, well, you've, you've got a long, a long run there from 2008 to today. So you've, you've taken your time, you've built the business, you've, you've created all the workflows, the drinks, the, um, the service uh, mentality and, and the way you're delivering service to your customers or experience to your customers. Um, so all that stuff's been worked out. Um, all the franchise information and materials are all ready to rock and roll. So uh, again, for our listeners, uh, if you're looking for a new idea, a new concept, um, coffee shop in a box, man. I love it. Thank you. Great. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's exciting. Yeah, that's, that, that's really awesome. So let me ask you a couple of operating questions sure. um, just to kind of touch on, you know, some of the challenges that, that our, um, uh, I guess, other restaurateurs are, are facing. And I'm not, I'm not so sure if it translates over, over to your business, uh, being in a quick serve, you know, more the, the, the coffee side of, of the house. Are you experiencing or have you experienced during COVID the, you know, the struggles with staffing or uh, costs, food costs, food shortages or ingredient shortages, I guess? Are you running into those as well? Yeah, we are. Um, we're not immune to those. I think we've been fortunate in a lot of respects. Um, I think the, the labor side of it is the first one because that's kind of the most pressing one that, that people seem to understand. Um, you know, we've been fortunate that we have built up a really good reputation. And so we have customers who come up and, and parents who recommend that their kids come work for us. You know, they tell their neighbors, oh, you should go talk to Paul. You should go work up at the Wake Oasis. It's a great place to work. We have uh, employees who recommend their friends come up and work or their siblings or their cousins, et cetera. And so 
you know, we're fortunate that we built a reputation of being a place where we treat people with respect, that it's a nice place to work, where we treat people well, we have a positive culture, all of those things. Mm-hmm. That helped us weather the labor storm a little bit. Um, it doesn't mean that we didn't get rained on. It doesn't mean that we, you know, didn't have to take precautions, but it meant that we stayed fully staffed throughout this time. We never had to abridge or amend our hours. We never had to close certain days. We never had a disruption in service. We never had to, you know, curtail operations in, in any respect. So we you know, and, and to be frank, we even have gone the other end. You know, early on in this, we kind of recognized that this is a problem that's coming on. And we said, okay, well, what are we going to do? You know, last April, you know, I sat down with the, the two managers that we had as we were talking about this. I said, this is going to be a problem. You know, where are we at with staffing? What do we have to do to head this off? And, you know, put the put the pedal to the metal. And we decided early on that other places, in my opinion, a lot of other restaurants, retail, restaurants, commercial establishments, even the local veterinary clinics, mm-hmm. um, customer service has gone down and the quality is not there and the prices have gone up. And what we've really leaned into the fact that, okay, well, if everybody else's service is going down, we need to try even harder. We need to aim for excellence. And if we if we fall short, that's going to happen sometimes. You can't be perfect all the time. But if you aim for excellence and you fall short, you're still going to be above average. But if you aim for average and you fall short, well, then you're below average. And that's just not acceptable. And so for us, it's really focusing on, on our culture, our employees, our customers. And the way I look at it is my job is to support the managers. The manager's job is to support the baristas and our team members. Their job is to support the customers and then the customers take care of me. I feel like a lot of other places, restaurants, cafes, and other places, they have the pyramid inverted a little bit and they've put the emphasis in the wrong place. But my opinion, you know, that's how we've taken it. And that's meant that we've paid people a little bit more. We've created um, tuition assistance programs to help our our employees go to college. So we have um, those those tuition assistance programs set up and um, that's helped us attract quality people, retain the best people, um, and, and, you know, build, build some level of, of loyalty and, um, positive culture amongst our team members. So that's just one example, but no, we, we, we really put a lot of effort in that. And then from the supply chain side, you know, we work with our suppliers and we talk with them months in advance. And so, you know, we've paid attention to what our menu is so that we can make sure that as we're doing limited time offerings and seasonal menus, Okay, well, what are the opportunities for disruption for supply chain? Okay, well, what drinks can insulate us the most from that? And so our our menu and our drink selection is going to be based on, okay, well, what do we think there's going to be the most plentiful, um, the least amount of scarcity throughout the the holidays? And so we, we, you know, made our menu selection based on that. We talk with our, our, for instance, our coffee supplier, and at the beginning of the year, we commit to, you know, X thousands of pounds of beans. So we talk to them ahead of time and say, this is what we're going to be doing. This is the bean we're going to be using. This is what we can commit to. And so that way we've kind of set a lot of those things aside. And so, um, and that's just one example, but yeah, we, we put a lot of effort into that, but to be frank, we've also had to, um, stockpile a lot more cups and spoons and all those things you didn't have to, you went from, you know, one to three week of one to three weeks of inventory on hand. And in some respects, for some of our products, you know, I have 12 to 16 weeks on hand now. And I'm ordering instead of one to three weeks out, I'm, you know, I just had some, our custom cold cups. I'm literally ordering four to six months out. And I have an extra storage unit on hand just to be able to have those because you have to have cups, right? You have to be able to serve coffee and something. And to me, it's not acceptable to um, reduce your quality or, or to reduce the perceived value. And so you want to make sure that you have those things available. So yeah, this is, you know, it's, but it's been hard, but it's one of those things that, you know, this is what you have to work through. Um, one of the benefits of the, 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 with the going back to the franchise stuff with the coffee shop in the box, but then also through the supplier relationship, you know, we've partnered with a really good logistics team, um, as far as logistics, supplying, vending, all of those things so that the uh, franchisees, there's really one-stop shopping for them. So all of the stuff that they would need, we would end up providing for them so that they don't have to go out and solve these individual supply chain issues by themselves. We absorb those problems and then we're able to deliver to them to make things easier. So that's just, you know, we we didn't really, when we started down this process, it was just like, oh, how do we make ease of ordering one of those things that we can offer people? 
Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't really understand in the beginning, oh, well, there's going to be a supply chain nightmare and this is going to be something that's going to be important for them. But right. it really has come come out to be something that is, um, we think, going to be meaningful for a lot of people. Instead of having, you know, dozens of franchisees out there all trying to solve the same problem, you know, one entity, i.e. us, we can solve that problem for them and then push those time savings out to other people. Yeah. Again, making it making it easy, taking taking problems and risk out, um, keeping things simple. And um, I guess as a, a franchisee, you just um, and, and you're going to recommend, you know, their you know, what they're holding in inventory and everything else as well. So they don't even have to figure that out. That's right. Well, it's yeah, we want them focus on being the best coffee shop owner you can be. Manage your staff, manage your customers, you know, work to your par levels in your inventory. Make sure that the drinks are delicious. Focus on these core aspects of the business. All of that other stuff, we help you take care of that. So, and as you know, there's a lot of independent shops out there. Um, you know, obviously I was an independent shop before we decided to franchise. And so as an independent shop, you are the head marketer. You are the head accountant. You are the head of, of everything. And so really you can only focus on so many things with, with a level of excellence at any given time. And so if we're able to take some of that burden off of individual business owners where they don't have to focus on the social media stuff, the marketing stuff, the promotion stuff, they don't have to focus on inventory and supply chain. They don't have to focus on all of these individual things. Well, now we can cleave off, you know, 60% of that effort. And then they can really focus on, okay, the day-to-day -day operations of being the best business owner. What that also helps them do for a lot of people who are interested in, in opening more than one of these if we can cleave off 60% of that work, well, then now what they're able to do is take that extra time that they have and maybe have two, three, four, five different locations because now they have a process in which they can manage these individual ones versus the, the death by a thousand cuts that can come from it. So that's what we, we're really working to try to solve those problems for people. I, I love it. It uh, looks like a great, great concept, a lot of opportunity, um, easy to get into. Um, you know, buy one, buy 10, uh, whatever you, whatever you want, Paul's ready to talk to you about it, right? We got Paul? you. We got you. <laughs> and let's not forget Marianne. Uh, oh, Mary. Yeah. She, we never forget Marianne. No way. Yeah. I just wanted to give her, give her a shout out as well, because she's part of this equation and she uh, is, she's fantastic. She's um, so we've been married. We had this year's our 20th anniversary. So we were, we were supposed to go to um, Hawaii to celebrate that this year, but it didn't, it didn't work out um, with, you know, when Delta came back up, it, you know, they, they started curtailing travel plans, but um, we'll, we'll find something else to someplace else to travel another way to celebrate. But um, no, she's fantastic. She's um, she is she, her background is engineering. So she's got a bachelor's and a master's in engineering. And so I am oftentimes, you know, I'm, I'm oftentimes an ideas person where I like, oh, well, we should do this. And um, I, you know, trying to visualize new ways we can do things. And, and she's always the grounded person who's often like, okay, well, how and so she's worked in lean manufacturing environments she's worked in supply chains she's worked in you know a quality engineer and, and now she's you know worked in sales and and project management so she's kind of bounced around um you know in the different professional industry all with the same company um but so she really has a lot of experience that helps us okay well you know the idea you have is good now let's test it and then it's really, yeah. that's where it's like, oh, okay. And you're validating the idea and you're really putting pen to paper and you're really making sure that, okay, well, we're able to implement this. Um, so yeah, she's, um, she's very helpful. Well, together you guys have a, a extremely strong resume and, uh, you know, it's a, and it's a little different because you're not necessarily coming, you're not the necessarily the chef, you know, creating and, and bringing, you know, great food or great drinks or whatever. You're kind of coming from a, a different background. Uh, but I think it's well suited for what you've done. You guys have put it to work beautifully. Well, I appreciate you saying that. I, I think so. I think our, our focus in, you know, how can you make the customer happy? You know, our focus is on delivering the best coffee experience. And that coffee experience comes with hospitality and delicious drinks. And so for me, the customer experience is, is the coffee experience is really the foremost importance. And so, um, you know, it's, it's, we put a lot of effort into, into doing that and it's revisiting, you know, workflows and it's interesting when we first really started digging into this, there's not a lot of, ex, um, 
there's not a lot of data or research on ergonomics for coffee shops. Um, and, and it's not going to surprise anybody to know that the biggest player that's out there, Starbucks, has um, they have their own research, but obviously they're not sharing that. It's not industry knowledge. Um, so what we started doing is looking at, okay, well, what other industries have um, maybe maybe analogous processes that we could we could apply to this? And so you start looking at the bar industry. And so, but, and there is a lot of, um, you know, from the, the bar and liquor industry, there is a lot of information on workflow and ergonomics and, um, you know, safety issues and, and all of those things. And so we really started incorporating, okay, well, what are some of those concepts that can be incorporated into design? How do you incorporate some of those things in the speed of service? My wife from the manufacturing background, you know, she can make recommendations on ways that we can improve efficiency as far as um, inventory and order management and order of operations. And it's even simple stuff like drink making. You know, we start with the least expensive ingredient, move to the most expensive ingredient. Because if you make a, if you're making a drink, that's a seven step drink and you make a mistake on step number two, well, now you're making a mistake with the least expensive ingredients versus the most ex expensive ingredients, which then becomes a more costly mistake. So it's those little things that you really don't think about, but we've really tailored those things in where it's like mistakes happen. Okay, well, how do you how do you mitigate the damage of that mistake? Um, anyway, those are just that's just one very small example of some of the bigger ways that we're really trying to focus on workflow management and and um, uh, managing to the details that we hope we're able to share with a lot of other people to help them be successful in their coffee businesses. Yeah, that that was a great example of uh, I've, I've never really thought about that in terms of building drinks and you know the same can be said in a bar and yeah and, exactly right etc. That. Um, and, and I doubt that there's a lot of that thinking going on in, in most of these, um, you know, in these, these bars and, and restaurants. Maybe there is, maybe I'm wrong, but um, that's just something I've never had heard anybody talk about. And, and I think it just adds to the, the fact that you guys are experts on, um, you know, on ergonomics, on workflows, on the, the construction side, the, mm -hmm. the quality control, you know, all the different things that you're bringing to the table here are, um, are really advantageous for franchisees and uh, can really help them, uh, as you said, start producing revenue faster and earning mm -hmm. a return on their investment quicker. Agreed. Yeah. And that's, that's the bottom line for us. So uh, again, um, you know, I think you guys have a great, great concept. Um, you know, this is uh, Paul Peterson, Wake Oasis Coffee for, you know, those who jumped in here late. Uh, talking about his uh, his and his wife um, wife's concepts, uh, they've got the traditional concept. They've got the, the coffee shop in a box concept, uh, which we focused here on on a lot early on because it was just so exciting and interesting and different and unique. It is um, that it is. it's that it's really a, a cool thing to talk about. Um, let me just kind of wrap this thing up a little bit. Sure. Just just asking you, um, you know, as a general rule, if if I'm a um, new restaurant owner, kind of just, or, or cafe owner, or anything, anybody in the food beverage business. Um, what words of wisdom or advice might you give me as, as I'm starting, you know, to try to figure out how to, how to grow and develop a business? And I, I didn't really give you a lot of warning on that one. No, Sorry. you're good. I think... I put, uh, really, I'm going to make it twofold. I think one, and I'm going to talk about it from the coffee perspective, and I think it can apply to both the, the food and the restaurant as well. Um, I always start with the team. You know, if you can build a really strong team and, and have them focused in a way that allows them to uh, deliver the best service possible, then I think that counts. Um, I have gone places before that might not have the best food, the best drink, the best of anything but they always have great service. You know, you go out to eat, but I've also gone places before that the food is delicious, but I've not gone back because the service is spotty. Nobody likes being treated poorly. Everybody likes being seen. Everybody likes being treated with respect. Everybody likes being treated um, in a very hospitable, welcoming way. And, and it doesn't have to be over the top. It doesn't have to be cheesy. It doesn't have to be anything like that. But I think what it does is it, it's, it's, being able to treat the customers and treat the public in a way that they deserve to be treated. And if you can couple that with, so that's going to be the first part is developing a team that's able to implement that vision, because I really think that's key. Um, I also think that, you know, it's one of those things, it's, it's always been interesting to me um, 
as we were going through the pandemic, I think one of the things that helped us be successful through the pandemic was the goodwill that we had built up based on how we've treated people. Um, so I think that that is, that's really just an underestimated thing. I think the second thing is, is as you're building your menu, whether it's a coffee or restaurant or other, other thing, you always have to be mindful of your margins. I've met with lots of different people who've talked about, well, we could do this drink and we can do this food item and we can do, you know, A, B, and C, whatever that is. It's like, okay, well, let's do the math. Sit down and look at what it, okay, now what can we charge for that product? It's like, okay, well, how long is it going to take to make that product? And so there are some things that might be very, very delicious and it would be an amazing thing to be able to serve. But if you, you know, you can't charge $10 for a drink, you know, you can't take 10 minutes to make a drink. So is it really something that's worth having on the menu? And so you have to have that point where you draw a line and you have to be able to say, no, this doesn't fit into our program. And your program might be something where you have a, a, you know, a higher, higher ticket cost, sit down type of environment. And you might be able to pull something like that off because that's the type of establishment that you have. But for, for our environment, it's really just crafting a menu and crafting a food and crafting a drink item that's based around our price point, our customer expectations, our level of service, and then also um, making sure that the margins work. And I think that there are a lot of places that, that have are very well-intentioned, um, but if your margins aren't there, you're just not gonna do well. There's, I, don't, I, don't know of any, I don't know of any establishment, you know, retail, restaurant, coffee shop, et cetera, that if their margins are off, they're gonna be successful. It just doesn't happen. So um, at the end of the day, you're, you're gonna be suffocating yourself a little bit at a time. Uh, so I think really those two things is what I would, I would try to focus on. What are your margins? How do you track those? Are, is your menu built around what you think you can sell it for? And are your margins kind of in, in the right place? And then also customer service. How do you, you know, how do you deliver on that promise to people? Um, I'm old school enough. I'm not that old. I'm, I'm 44, but I'm old school enough where growing up, going out to eat or going out to buy something to consume was a special treat. Like it was a big deal to be able to go out for ice cream or to be able to go out, you know, once a month to go out for pizza and be able to pick out like my own soda at the restaurant. Like it was a big deal to be able to go out. And so I respect the fact that if anybody decides to come up to my coffee shop and pay two to $7 for a coffee, like that's a big deal. Like there's a lot of respect that I have for um, that person deciding to spend, you know, their time equivalent, i.e. money at my establishment. And so you have to respect that every single time. And so that means, you know, making sure that you're, you're delivering on your promise to them every single time. So I think it's just respecting that too. So I think that's three things. Oh, but, that was awesome. Yeah, that was great. I was taking notes as you were, as you were sharing and I'll go back and, and listen to that because that'd be some great, great content to put out there. And, um, you know, I think you're right. And, and, especially when you're talking about the margins and the menu and, and all that, I was just sitting here thinking that's another reason why this franchise model is a, is a great lowered risk opportunity for anyone wanting to get into the game um, because you've already done all that math. You've already done those time studies of, you know, how long does it take to make this drink and factored all that in and uh, your team's going to you know, provide the advice and counsel and guidance that someone would need that, so that they don't have to go out and, and actually test it themselves and figure it out. So that's uh, that's true. And that's, you know, it, it goes back into menu creation. We talked about you had asked the question before about staffing and supply chain. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that we've recently done is we we tweaked our menu a little bit and added higher value, but lower labor time. Uh, to create menu items on there, knowing that if there's going to be a labor issue, you can fold those items in the menu a little bit easier. So what, what I mean by that is, you know, we have some specialty nitro drinks and a nitro is a cold brew that you infuse with beverage grade nitrogen that comes through a, a tap like a keg. Mm -hmm. um, but it's faster for somebody to make. It's an easier drink for somebody to make, but it's a higher margin item and it's a, um, it's a high value item. So it's one of those things that you can add to the menu that makes it a little bit easier for you to um, um, take advantage of the current environment. So that's just one example, but I think it's just, um, I think there's lots of different examples, but I think it's just somehow you have to reconcile your your menu with the margins and, and what a customer is willing to pay for. And that's just, that's challenging for a lot of people, particularly somebody who's a chef or who views themselves as, as, as some sort of a food or a drink artist because they're like, oh, well, 
you know, it really should be this way. And they get hunkered down on how they think it should be. And it's like, it's not about you. Like it's about the customer, you know, it's about, and it's really fo- taking that, that emphasis off of you and shifting it to the person who it should be on, which is the customer. Yeah. Um, so that, anyway, that's my opinion. No, I think it's great. I appreciate you sharing it. And I appreciate you taking time to, to be here with us on the podcast today to share your experience and to kind of tell us the story of Wake Oasis Coffee and, um, you know, what makes you guys special. I think you've uh, done it very articulately and, um, you know, with a great deal of, of, uh, of content, great advice, great um, things to think about as you uh, go forward, uh, whether you own a restaurant or a coffee shop or uh, a bar, a diner, whatever it is that you got, you know, many of these things that we talk about uh, on our podcast are, are, you know, can cross over uh, into, into other categories and are very helpful in terms of running a successful business. So thank you, Paul, for being on and for sharing all that you have today. I appreciate I appreciate you hosting me, Jeff. And if anybody needs to find us, they can find us at www.wakeoasiscoffee.com. You can reach me at Paul at Wake Oasis Coffee. And then on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, it's Wake Oasis Coffee. So we try to keep it simple. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I like I like it. You got some TikTok action going. We got some. T- I think we've got um, we've had a couple of TikTok videos go viral on there. I think we've got over six thousand followers on on there. So we try to have fun with it. So. Oh wow! Well, yeah. it sounds sounds like a great brand, great opportunity. And uh, again, we thank you for being on the show. And for all our listeners, we thank you for uh, joining us for another episode of Local Leaders Podcast. I'm your host Jeff Johnson, and uh, for Paul Peterson of Wake Oasis Coffee, and I uh, thank you for joining us, and uh, we look forward to talking to you at the next uh, podcast. Hey, and one final thing uh, in regards to uh, what's going on with, with Paul. He's got a uh, podcast, and I want to want to give you an opportunity to just talk a little bit about the podcast and what you're doing with it. Awesome. Yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, so it's called the Coffee Business Podcast. And the whole premise behind it is we answer the specific questions that people have about having a business in the coffee industry. And so it, it's, it's a short podcast. It's typically only 10 to 15 minutes. It could be about customer service. It could be about finding a good supplier. It could be de- about uh, developing your menu. It could be about um, how beans are imported into the country. It could be about roasting, you know, how, you, how, how decaf beans might be uh, done a little bit differently than, um, than caffeinated beans. So all these little aspects we talk about and we really just take one specific question and we answer that one question. And so we try to keep it as simple as possible for people. So yeah, it's called the Coffee Business Podcast. Um, on our website, wakeoasiscoffee.com, uh, there's a, um, a blog section on there. Where we have not only uh, news articles about us, but then also we have um, links to the podcast, but you can find us on Spotify, you can find us on Apple, you can find us on uh, Google. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. So, and if we had any uh, feedback questions, we have sometimes people email us questions about uh, that they'd like answered. So we're gonna be answering those as well. So yeah, it's real exciting, Jeff. All right, perfect. Well, I appreciate uh, again, you being here and, and having a chance to, uh, to share your story and I uh, look forward to checking out the, the podcast as well. Uh, sounds really cool. I like the short, you know, the 10 minute kind of version. It's down and dirty and quick and you're focusing on one, one thing at a time. So that's that's amazing. I'm sure it'll be a, a great value for a lot of our listeners. So uh, tune in, guys. All right. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Paul.